what we call the expo zone, and how we are using it uh, to make an impact in, in autism research. Uh, before I start, because today I'm, I'm presenting as a professor at an academic not-for-profit institution, that's Mount Sinai. I just want to declare, I, I gave a talk yesterday and under a different hat that uh, we spun out a startup company called Linus Biotechnology, and I'm its one of the scientific founders and it, I'm a CEO. So there's a conflict of interest, not a perceived conflict of interest, a, a real financial conflict of interest, and as academics, uh, I like to declare that. I'm going to share only about three slides from my talk yesterday, and this is one of them. That when we started out on this journey, we decided that one of the things we will absolutely do is put families at the center of our both our scientific discovery and how we communicate those discoveries. And I'll give you some examples of what that really means as we go on. Much of my talk is dedicated towards how we are developing a platform for biomarkers that can aid in early detection and clinical monitoring once a patient is diagnosed. And to some extent, I'm also going to talk about some clinical trials we're doing for therapeutic development. But why do we want to detect autism early? That's an important question. I suspect what I'm going to show you next is a graph that everyone in this room has probably seen because there's like a million different versions of this graph on the internet. But I still like to always start here. Our brain is developing rapidly. If you look at some fetal MRIs of the human brain in the simplest of measures like density, the human brain density quadruples in a couple of months. So that's just a way of saying a lot is happening in the human brain and it's happening very quickly. What's interesting here is that things that are really important to autism, language, sensory pathways that lead to later socialization, how we react to our environment. A lot of that is happening in the first one year of life. Let's put families, including myself as a parent, as a clinician, at the center of this very simple idea. And here is the problem. There are no FDA approved biomarkers to detect children within the first year of life. That's when all the action is happening at a molecular level. So why is this important? Because that is a critical window of opportunity. I always give this very almost cheesy analogy when I'm speaking to undergraduates, and I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it here. What we currently do in autism is like putting on your helmet after your motorbike accident, right? You miss that critical window of opportunity when that helmet would have saved your head. So the first year of life for me is a real window of opportunity when we should be putting a lot of effort. But there have been real challenges in how to identify children, how to identify pathways for treatment at this time. This is an area that's not entirely accepted. We don't have consensus, but it gives me hope. We know that if you detect autism early, these are not studies that are done in the first year of life, these are later, there are impacts that therapy can have for some children, right? And like Prabhilaji said, a 5% improvement can mean a lot to the quality of life. So when I look at work like this, it gives me hope, but as this work dies, starts getting a bit old, there are newer technologies coming that can deliver therapy early. And we, 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 are, we are having some very healthy conversations in that sector. This is one of the slides I'm sharing from yesterday because this is the best way for me to convey to you why we focused on what we call the Expo Zone. So this was work that was uh, mostly, except for the, the last row, was published by a colleague of mine who's retired, Steve Rappaport. And he just studied heritability of diseases using a large European data set of twins. So if you have identical twins and one twin gets a disease and the other one always gets it, you know it's highly heritable, there's a strong genetic factor. And if uh, one twin uh, gets a disease and the identical twin never gets the disease, then well, you know the genetics is, is or it's not very heritable. That's not an accurate way of think, thinking of genes because heritability does not equal genetics, but it's a good starting point. So where does autism fall in this? Now again, there are many camps, right? Some people say it's all genetic, I don't believe that. I also don't believe it's all environmental. It's a, it's a mix of the two. 
My problem is not that I'm on either side of this argument. My problem is what several speakers yesterday described, and, and Sarika Ji, one of the, the co-organizers, the co-founders, gave this very nice slide of NIH funding. That autism gets a very tiny slice of NIH funding. What I want to do next is, in that tiny slice, or the tiny pie, show you that the non-genomic, the exposomic factor, part of it gets an even smaller share and most of it has gone to genomic research. So there is injustice and then there's another layer of injustice here that we're just focusing on parts of autism that are ignoring and ignoring other parts of autism. There's a real challenge here, a scientific challenge, when you look at the non-genomic or the exposomic parts. Unlike our genes, so your base genomic sequence is set at conception. You'll have some epigenetic changes, but for the most part, I can do a cross-sectional analysis and really figure out your genome at any stage of life. But your exposomic part changes at a scale of hours. So what you're eating today, these bagels and the coffee, is very different to what you will eat at night, unless you're a New Yorker like me and a bagel is good at any time of the day. But the way my body metabolizes that bagel is very different from morning versus night. So even though my exposure is the same, my internal response to that exposure changes on a daily level. So how do I figure out what's happening to me, you know, in the past two months, six months, one year, two years, 50 years? That's what I call the black box of time. We've talked about children having, you know, periods of heightened sensitivity and, and response in autism. And this happens, you know, at some intervals. I'm going to show you some real data here. I showed this yesterday, but I'm going to show it, in, show it again here, because this is, for me, the best way to convey what is the problem of time. Let's say there's an exposure that's harmful for you. You don't need to worry about what it is. You do a blood test, so you want it to be really low, and it is really low here, so you think this person is perfectly fine, right? But that shouldn't be our way of judging whether you're fine or not. That those once in a year blood tests that we do are just snapshots. That's not how we should judge whether we are healthy or not. The reason you have a heart attack today is not because well, you did something today, unless you went for a marathon and you're in my shape and you just, you know, should stick to walking. It's what happened and what you were doing in the past many years, many months. What led up to that moment? And this is what led up to this person's moment, right? There's an event that happened to them. I'm not going to go into the details, but we took 2,000 measurements. And if you look at the x-axis, we've gone back two years, right? 700 days, about two years. And you see in the middle year, a lot happened to them. So the blood test would say, oh, this exposure is not of concern to you, or this biological response is of, of no consequence, that would be very wrong. But here's the innovation. All of this data, these 2,000 biopsies, you can say, is done sequentially, is done from a single sample, a single strand of hair. Right? So it's done non-invasively. We are traveling two years back in time, and we are doing an analysis that at this resolution was four hourly. We have done it even at one hourly resolution. How do we do it? I take no credit for this idea. This, I always say the idea found me. I was looking at a cut down tree, I saw these growth rates, and as you start looking back in the tree's history, I realized that's the problem people were saying is intractable. Actually, it's very tractable. All you need to do is look at our biology or some tissues in our biology like a hard drive, like the hard drive of your computer. The reason it stores information and not just because it captures everything, the reason your hard drive stores your Word documents is because it preserves the sequence in which the information was entered. If you open your Word documents and all the letters are out of order, it's a senseless document. You need the spaces, the letters, the grammar. And we found that, you know, in certain tissues in the human body, including baby teeth and human hair, we see these growth rings, we can map them. We had to build hardware. It took, took a, a real, you know, uh, technological, uh, effort to build hardware and laser, and we've done that, and they're, they're quite refined now. So let's go back to the point of putting families at the center. I'm saying we should detect autism in, at birth, but does it actually exist at birth? Because in the US, on average, we detect autism around the age of four. 
And that statistics has been so stubborn, it's not moving, right? If you live in some remote area in the middle of, uh, you know, in a small agricultural community, that's closer to the age of six. So there's a real disparity there as well. We started off, and I always like when I see a disorder where there, there's a genetic component and a non-genomic component, I like starting off with twins. So to the families in the room who are not scientists, how do we use twin studies? Well, you can only have three kinds of twins. You can have twins who are, you know, both don't have autism, twins where both have autism, or twins where one has autism and one does not. So this is just called a core twin analysis. And by comparing between them, you can come up with an idea of, if not how much the genetic contribution is, at least you're controlling for some of the genetics. This is what we found, and I'll, I'll simplify this graph, and, and this is redrawn from the journal, because the graph in the journal is very technical, so we just redrawn it. This blue bar is showing zinc regulation, right? And don't just look at the blue line, look at the whole band. And this black horizontal line tells you whether there's a difference between that sibling who had autism and who did not. Now, to the parents in the room, if you look here and the band touches the black line, there is no difference. If you go before this area, there is no difference. So if you did a blood test here, you wouldn't find anything. The reason is that this dysregulation only exists in the time dimension. So, it exists here between minus 10 and 4 weeks of birth. And because of our technology, we can actually go before birth. We can start mapping the growth rings that were formed before birth. And this is what we call a critical window. That between minus 10 and plus 4 weeks, there was this dysregulation of zinc. I'm not implying a zinc deficiency. I'm saying the biological response is such that there is a dysregulation. Remember, these were twins. Some of them were discordant twins. So the mother's diet is the same. Because you have the same mother, the same placenta. But there's a dysregulation. And so what, you know? Small sample, Swedish twins. Does this really mean anything? So, we kept going and I'm going to show you some more results. I'm going to move that graph to the, to the bottom. You can think of zinc as an elemental, as a dietary exposure, but in reality there's a lot that zinc does in the body, so it's also a biological response. But a much easier concept of understanding biological response is good old-fashioned inflammation. And I keep talking about growth rings, I'm actually showing you what I think is the very first map ever made, a daily map of fetal inflammatory response going into early life. And you can actually see the growth rings of C-reactive protein, which is one of the inflammatory markers we use. So you can actually see that it really is like growth rings in the tree. And that's what I mean. The idea found me, it's not that I, I, I made these growth rings. So we went back to our Swedish cohort and we found that just before birth, the children with autism have a higher inflammatory response. There's another bump here, and you can see that there are many bumps actually if you look at that map of continuous heightened states of inflammation. But still, it's that same population, maybe just something that happens in twins. So we went to Texas, this is the general population, you know, completely unrelated, very different country, very different diet. By now, some of you in the room will be noticing, oh, something very interesting is happening in the time dimension. And that's this. Something happens just towards the third triangle or the third trimester where your body is undergoing a systemic dysregulation. There's a drop in zinc metabolism, this increased inflammation, and now we have replicated this in two different populations. It was around this I thought, at this time we thought that, look, something interesting is happening here. But I don't believe anything, and our mantra is replicate, 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 because if you have hit on something really, really real, then it will stand the stress test of moving to different population. Just like if you have diabetes in Sweden, and you can use the same test, and, and you have diabetes in the US, it works everywhere. That was our discovery population in Sweden. We did the same thing in New York, saw similar differences. Don't worry about what those differences are. Uh, we, this is, we don't have the time to go into all the technical details, but it's a dysregulation. Um, same thing in Texas, same thing in the UK, and a, another independent correlation. And if you uh, just pull all this data, you have better power, and you see that difference. And this is now what I call a medium-sized study in autism, about 200 subjects. It's not large by any means, but it's no longer a small study. And, 
because we replicated it so many times, we start being like, okay, there, there's something there. But again, let's put families at the center of this. Right? So this is good academic research, in my biased view. But how does this help families? Right? So we want to get back on our on track and see how we can detect autism earlier, you know, as early as birth. So we went back to that idea, replicate, 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 and this time we did studies in US and my established collaboration in Sweden, but we also did a national study in Japan. And again, we are looking at cases and controls. We said, you know, this time let's stress test the algorithm, make it more clinically useful because even though every child is going to shed 20 baby teeth, you can't just get a tooth whenever you want. Let's try hair this time. So not only are we replicating in different cultures and geographies, because let's face it, all our participants in Japan are Japanese, right? There's no Hispanic kid there, there's no Indian kid there. New York, we're such a, the whole country, we're such a wonderful mix of different types of people. So that itself is a test. In Japan, they eat a lot of seafood, we don't, things like that. We are also replicating across tissues, hair and teeth. So very different kind of tissues, but the idea is the same, that they have growth rings in them. <coughs> Excuse me. So this was the general scheme of our, our logic, why we are going to do this. We extended this study to now what I call a moderately larger size, uh, which is about 500 subjects. And we wanted to do a population national study, which was in Japan, but they had different centers assessing autism, and because of that variability, we rechecked every file, every clinical file was checked by the same uh, uh, pediatric neurologist to reach a consensus diagnosis. In Sweden, we actually fly in from all over the country, paid participants to a single clinical center in Stockholm. And then, of course, at Mount Sinai, we just tested in a clinical setting. We'll remember, Epidemiologic research doesn't reflect real life. You don't walk in for, for your autism test with your perfectly matched control. You walk in as an individual patient. So that's what we're doing in New York. All these results, are, are everything I'm showing you, uh, except for the in inflammatory graphs which are under review, are available full text, uh, open access. We always use open access, so families, you don't have to pay for it or get a membership at a library. So these are the results. You can see this arrow, our C curve is looking pretty good. Our sensitivity is quite good. Our specificity is what I just called good, workable, but I'm not, you know, it, we will keep trying to get, get it better. It works across genders. It works out different age group. There's some differences. Nothing is statistically significant yet, but we'll keep working on that. And we, we, we want to do more. So this sample size is good as a discovery. We probably want to cross about 1,000 participants before we say, yeah, this is ready for clinical rollout. <coughs> so we are, we, are, we are well on the way of early detection as early as birth. We know a signature exists, even in the third trimester. But how do we help develop treatment? If all you're handing out is yes and no answers, that's not what pharma companies need, right? Because they already have patients diagnosed in their clinical trials. What they need are modifiable pathways. So this is how our AI works. And I'm going to show you what all these dots in these graphs mean right at the end. But we just pointed at this one participant. And he says, yes, we've analyzed all these pathways that we know are linked with increased risk of autism. But for this individual, these are the pathways. I'm sharing some that are published. The other ones, well, IP issues and all of that. What that does is really bring precision medicine into the fold. These specific pathways are the drivers of the risk in this individual. And some of them, they are existing compounds that can target these pathways. So what we are doing is we are part of a phase two autism drug trial. I'm not at liberty to, to share with which company. Uh, we are also doing a nutraceutical trial Again, I'm not at liberty to, because these are their drugs, they're nutraceutical, this is a different company. But they, they did a press release, and so if you just read this, uh, you will get the information that I, I'm allowed to share anyway, but it's a nutraceutical product that, that is focused on what they call biohealth health. I do believe it will have uh, implications for autism as well. So, okay, we're delivering 
information on early diagnosis. We are delivering information or our platform can be used to develop treatment. But again, put the family at the center, but this time they're sitting at the clinician's office and they don't just want a yes and no answer for autism because it's a spectrum. We want to know what kind of autism you're having. I mean, this is one of our first steps towards subtyping. What you see here is that we can distinguish those cases that have um, autism from the neurotypicals, but also those cases that have both autism and ADHD and those that only have ADHD. <coughs> because this is an academic talk, I'll, I'll share one concern I have with this graph. And it, 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 it's not because of our platform, it's because of some, some other reason. It's too clean, right? When I look at this graph, I say, well, you know what? There are days when I show ADHD symptoms, although, you know, I'm, I'm neurotypical, there will be days, all of us, and it's, it's a fact that we'll have some hyperactivity. The reason we, we feel this is so tight and so separated is because at the end of the day, our AI is training against clinical labels. A clinician says you have ADHD, so you have ADHD. A clinician says you have a neurotypical. What we don't do is do five tests on me, some on a good day, some sometimes when I miss lunch, I'm, well, I am not typical of uh, when I miss lunch. That's just the one in case the talk goes over. Um, and so I really believe there should be more spread here. But that's just me being an academic skeptical of, of my own results. Sure, so that's one thing we need. We're working on the regressive type of feed, of regressive uh, subtype, we're working on several other subtypes, and, and the data is coming through. But we also want to know what kind of severity you have. So in two of our populations, we have ADOS2 scores. Uh, this is a trained algorithm, so we only use 80% of the data, and then we tested it on predicted it on 20%. So this is looking okay. This is looking decent. However, you will see we are off by about half a ADOS score. So what we what is measured and what we predict, we are off by about half a score, which is which is not too bad. But as early results, this is looking this is looking pretty good. So where we are is that you know we feel we can detect autism early, we can identify which pathways are driving your autism, we can subtype it to some degree. We can also start looking at the upcoming severity of autism. However, you know, all of these, we are, <coughs> we are always comparing our biomarker to the clinical measures. And let's face it, you know, the, the clinical measures of autism are not perfect. Even autism clinicians will, will accept that. So how about we compare it against another biomarker? And this we were very picky because we said we want to compare it to another biomarker which also gives us some mechanistic information. So our, some of our participants, what we did was, and this paper is under review, uh, we did fMRI. We said there are multiple papers showing that there are fMRI differences in autistic children versus non-autistic children. Can we predict those differences? Now, I, I'm completely ignorant about everything fMRI, so I'm going to show you the results. Uh, what you see is what, pretty much what I can explain, that our dynamic uh, mapping shows these strong correlations with specific aspects of brain function. So again, what we are seeing is that the, the biomarkers that we are finding do predict this mechanistic view of brain connectivity, brain function. Before I conclude, just a quick insight or just a quick window into what is coming down, you know, coming down the pike in the future. So I said I, I would show you what this uh, graph uh, looks means in, in, our, in one of the previous slides, and this is what we are doing. Our primary focus is very much autism and then ADHD and, and your developmental disorders that, that cluster around there. But because it's a unified platform, you know, when a hair is sent to us and we analyze it, the technicians don't know where it comes from. Sometimes it's, it's a hair from a 60-year-old with ALS. We are studying IBD. Again, we are interested in IBD because of autism. So many autistic children have gastric symptoms. What's really interesting here is that the psychosis cluster, and I wouldn't have believed this if, if, if someone had told me before I did this work, the psychosis cluster is showing pathways that are quite unique, whereas the IBD and the autism cluster are much closer together. That's something interesting, and we need to explore that more. So just, just to summarize, uh, the, the work that we have done so far is really looking at 
these new biomarkers that can detect autism early in life and also provide a platform for drug discovery and drug replication. And again, we keep replicating them in different populations, different geographies, and also across different tissues. And I, I feel that that is good science. If, if you can see syndromic signatures across different tissues, then the chance that you're onto something will increase. I want to thank uh, the organizers again, and because you, you have been so kind to share your family uh, with me and let me meet some of your children, I just want to share my family with you. I'm a father of triplets. Um, being, being a dad, uh, when they were about, I think, three, four months old, I was just late coming in from work. I decided to have a beer with some of my friends. By the time I came home, I was ready for a good scolding, but I found my wife. She's feeding all three of them. She figured out how to do it. They're all getting breast milk. One's getting milk expressed in a bottle. And you know, so sometimes I just look back and think it, it, it really is a, is a blessed journey. Uh, th thank you again. Thank you again, everybody.